Good morning. I think I can do better with this on. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. I think I can hear my own voice now. If you are new here this morning, my name is Edgar Momo. I serve on the pastoral staff here at ZF. We have been exploring a new series titled, Jesus Has Something to Say About That, for the past two Sundays. And the first teaching, Taylor Sutton, reminded us that the one commodity society never seems to run out of supply is opinions. Yet, amidst this abundance, we often overlook what Jesus has to say about that or whether he has an opinion about our opinions. This morning, we will continue with a series on a different subject, which I believe is cursed in many spiritual lives, home situations, and society. That commodity is thanksgiving or thankfulness. It is a reality that we need to reintroduce into our lives. Throughout this series, we will delve into passages from Luke and probably other Gospels where Jesus engages with people and challenges their thoughts on various issues. The aim of this series is to remind us that what Jesus has to say is not just worth listening to, but it's our responsibility to allow ourselves to be challenged, corrected by the Lord Jesus on various aspects of our lives, including gratitude. Let us pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning. It is interesting. I'm thanking you this morning because we are talking about Thanksgiving, a rarity in our lives. How we pray you will challenge us this morning. Open our eyes to see in the areas in which we have so woefully failed to be grateful for the many things you have done for us. We give you the praise, the glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's read a text together. If you do not have a Bible, there is one right in front of you, the seat under, uh, in, under the seat in front of you. And you can find the text that we are reading today from in page 876. And if you, don't, if you do not own a Bible, please take that home. It's our gift to you. Let's read together Luke 17, 11 to 19. It reads, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God, with a loud voice, he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, When well, not ten cleansed, where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise. Go your way. Your faith has made you well. The backdrop of this narrative is, is of profound significance. It does not only showcases the power and authority of Jesus 
as he approaches the climax of his ministry, heading towards Jerusalem, where he would eventually be crucified, but also hints at the appropriate response when we encounter him. Therefore, at the heart of the story lies one man's reaction. A grateful Samaritan leper when the Lord cleansed him with nine other lepers. So my aim this morning is to present a compelling case to convince you that gratitude to God is not just a feeling, but a tangible evidence of our understanding of Christ's transformative and life-changing work in our lives. The gospel in four short words You've heard Drew say this here, God, guilt, grace, and it ends with gratitude. God gave his law. We sinned against him. We feel guilty. Christ came, brought grace to us. But what do we do when Christ, we encounter Christ's grace? We should be full of gratitude. I mean, continual gratitude. Gratitude not just at a time of salvation. Come along with me as I make my case. Our text has four movements. One, the leper's request for mercy. You will find that in, in verses 11 to 13. The second movement, Jesus responds with a command. You'll find that in verse 14. And the third movement in the text is a leper demonstrates gratitude. You'll see that in verse 15 to 16. And lastly, the fourth movement, Jesus responds with a commendation, and that is found in verse 17 to 19. So let us dig in. First movement here, the leper's request for mercy. Verse 11 reads, On the way to Jerusalem, he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, he was met by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Luke begins his narrative by placing Jesus in a geographical location. This was not entirely uncommon for the writers of the gospel to GPS Jesus' movement as he went about his earthly ministry. However, Luke's pinpointing where Jesus was heading and the geographical location was probably intended to set the stage for what would later become the story's highlight. Come along with me. There's going to be a highlight, a high climax, a twist in the story that Luke really wanted us to learn. Some commentators even suggest that a reference to Jesus passing between the borders of Samaria and Galilee on his way to Jerusalem makes no geographical sense, except in the case of itineration, because both borders take you east and west. While to go to Jerusalem, you would have to go south. East and west. But Luke is trying to call our attention to something here. Perhaps one tension Luke intends to create for his readers is the possibility of Jesus interacting with the Samaritans just like he had done earlier in his ministry in John chapter 4 when he met with a woman at the well. So towards the tail end of his ministry again, he seeks another opportunity for Jesus to showcase Jesus' mercy to the unlikely. And that's why he is placing him in between Galilee and Samaria. Luke advanced his narrative that as he entered the village, he was met 
by ten lepers, who stood at a distance and lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. In verse 12 and 13, however, Luke does not mention the village's name, but immediately narrates what happened in that village. The name of the village had no significance, but Luke is drawing his, his reader's attention to what happened in that village. Ten lepers met Jesus. Let me give you a quick overview of what being a leper meant in early Jewish society. To do this, one would have to refer back to Leviticus, the book we just, com- we just concluded, famously known for where Bible readings go to die. We see this in chapter 13 and 14, in which the Lord instructed Moses about the ceremonial laws regarding leprosy. Excuse me. This OT law stipulated that anyone declared by the priest to have leprosy should wear, turn clothes, and let his hair, the hair of his head, hang loose and shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall leave alone. His dwelling shall be outside of the camp. That was the case of a leper. We we'll see that in Leviticus chapter 13, 45 to 46. So it was a no-brainer that the ten lepers approached Jesus from a distance. However, the boundary established by leprosy did not prevent the unanimous call for mercy when they saw Jesus. Verse 13 says, they lifted up their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They were united in their misery, in their misery and united in their plea for help as well. Regardless of the difference, in their ethnicity, which we would note shortly, these men were united by many things, such that their prejudices did not matter at all. I quote here what Barclay has to say. It says, A common misfortune broken down, broken down the racial national barriers had broken down the the racial and national barriers. And the common tragedy of their leprosy, they had forgotten. They were Jews and Samaritans. And remember only that they were men in need. They were men in need. All the prejudices had evaporated. Their disease had relegated them to the low lives of society. They had lost everything, family, friends, social interactions, and the love and touch of their loved ones. Not too long ago, we all experienced COVID's, COVID-19's devastating effect on our society and the world as a whole. We saw how many people watch their loved ones die from a distance without a privilege of being by their side. But before that, devastating images emerged from West Africa, where I, uh, where I came from originally, during the Ebola pandemic. One incident that, burned, that is burned in my memory happened in Sierra Leone where all the adults in a particular village sent their children across the road that ran through the village so that the disease did not infect them. But sadly, there was no one to care for those children. And the worst part was when those children watched from a distance, their parents die of the disease across the road. 
just across the road. They are on this side of the road. Their parents are here sick with Ebola, far worse than COVID-19. They watch their parents die from a distance. The stigma and scourge of, of a leper required that they sound a warning. Unclean, unclean. Each time they move around, even outside of town, which was their abode, lest they come into contact with anyone. Could you imagine how painful and difficult it will be for us to wear our sins this morning are like badges and herald our own unworthiness and guilt. Imagine how shameful that would mean or be for each one of us. If I were to stand here this morning like I wear all my struggles, my sinful struggles as a badge, and I tell you I'm unworthy, unclean. This is what is going on in my heart. And you turn around and do the same. You bet it will not be a wonderful sight to behold. These lepers may have heard about Jesus' ministry and wanted his help. They did so in apparent recognition of his authority and power. They addressed him by his title, Master. And his name, Jesus, which indicated calling on someone superior for help. This is the only time a non-disciple or apostle referred to Jesus as master in the Gospels. The only time. He has been ministering all throughout. He's on his way to Jerusalem where he's going to die. And these ten lepers called him master. Not teacher, not son of God, not rabbi, but they called him master. Luke chooses this same appellation the disciples used for Jesus in chapter 8. Luke 8, 22 to 25. When they woke him up during the storm, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. You see that in Luke 8, 24. Then the hymn, Master, the tempest is raging, suddenly comes to mind. I love hymns, so bear with me if I have to quote a few of them here this morning. And it reads here, Master, this first stanza reads, Master, the tempest is raging. Oh, the billows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness. Oh, no shelter or help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie? How canst thou lie asleep? Asleep when each moment is so madly threatening. A grave, a grave, a grave in the angry deep. Get up, Jesus, because the winds and the waves shall obey thy will. All you got to say, peace, be still. Well, these lepers clearly understood that Jesus, if only they can get Jesus' attention like the disciples, they would get his compassion. They understood this. Similarly, just like the lepers, our sins make us unclean before our holy and just God. But thank God, the cross has brought down every barrier between us. And God. So we can ask God for mercy through Christ and He will hear us. This leads us to the next movement in this, uh, in this passage, verse 14. Jesus responds with a command. Once the lepers got Jesus' attention, doubt about His compassion was removed immediately. Because verse 14 reads, When he saw them, he said to them, 
Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. It is interesting to note here that rather than commanding the lepers to be clean, which was in his power and authority to do, he commanded them to go and show themselves to the priests according to the Levitical ceremonial law that you, you will find in Leviticus 13 and 14. But what was the point of commanding them to go and show themselves to the priest before healing was accomplished? This interplay was necessary to showcase the leper's faith and its implication for our trust and the promises of the Lord today. It is important to show the faith of the lepers and its implication for our trust in the promises of the Lord today. Although they had not been healed instantly, they believed and obeyed the master's command. Then the miracle happened. The text says, as they went... They were cleansed. In other words, this was a miracle activated by obedience. I firmly believe many Christians today fail to enjoy the promises of God prescribed in His Word due to a lack of faith or to act in obedience on His commands. When it comes to obeying God or acting in faith, we do not have to check all our rational boxes or see reason to believe before acting in faith or obeying his word. Sometimes we want it to make sense to us and thereby miss out on the pleasure of his promises. I grew up in Africa with a saying, the start of my faith whenever I struggled to believe God's word. It's, it simply goes like this. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It always helps me. This is very much, you know, similar to the popular acronym WWJD that used to help Young believers in the face of temptations. The former saying that I grew up on does not imply that you never question anything or is a call to blind faith in all things. Instead, it suggests that whenever the devil assails you to the point of doubting God's word, let the efficacy of the written promises be your resolve. When the devil is assailing you, let the efficacy, the truthfulness of God's word be a resolve. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And trust him and wait and see what he can do. But there was still a catch in the command the Lord gave the lepers based on the succeeding verses. You see, for all we know now, this group of lepers comprised of both Jews and at least a Samaritan. So for the Jewish lepers, Jerusalem was their likely destination because that was the location of the temple where sacrifices would have been made. But what about the Samaritan leper? His probable destination would have meant a journey to Mount Jerusalem. However, regardless of which priest they were to show themselves to, the lepers took Jesus at his word, and they journeyed. And as they journeyed, cleansing from their leprosy took place. But did they all notice the life-changing events that had just happened? No doubt, they saw the change based on the succeeding verses. And this leads us to the next movement 
in this narrative, that, which is a leper demonstrates gratitude, 15 and 16. There are three significant activities in these verses that we must not miss. Luke says in verse 15, please follow along because these are very crucial. This is a crux of our message this morning. And so please come along with me. Verse 15 Read says here, one, three things we have to look for. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. Verse 15, we see, we see it in verse 15. There's a lot to unpack here, as I already just said. First, while they were on their way, one of them saw that he was healed. This suggests that the other nine also noticed the life-changing event that had happened in their lives. There is no way they did not get the same experience because a common misfortune bound them together. They made a unanimous request on Jesus for mercy together. And they all obeyed his command together. They didn't do anything extra to deserve the Lord's compassion. Nothing. They just said, son of... Master, have mercy on us. So without a doubt, they were all cleansed. In fact, Jesus himself proved this later in the narrative when he questioned the grateful man. Were there not ten cleansed? To make this more relatable, imagine a class of students awaiting their final grades for a qualifying examination, which they expect to pass. It is unconscionable to imagine that one student will notice that their grades have been released without sharing the good news with the others. There's no way. We've all in this together. So if I find in my email that the grades have been released, I'm going to tell everybody, oh, the grades are out. The grades are out. So the leper who received healing must have said, I'm healed. Look at me. I'm free. And the others did see that as well. But what distinguished this grateful leper from the other nine is that he took the next bold step. He turned back to the direction his healing had come from. In other words, he returned to Jesus praising God in a loud voice just as they had done when they requested for mercy from the Lord. Same way. What about you? When you are desperate, when you are in need, you lament, you cry, you ask God, please help me, please help me, please help me. How do you go back to give him thanks? Just walk away. This man demonstrates here in a loud voice he came back praising the Lord. But this was a risky move because on the surface level, he was violating the long-standing OT command Jesus gave to them and to show themselves to the priests. But in reality, this grateful former leper was willing to risk it all, his desired healing, and all in place of all the religious regulations in order to praise God from whom all blessings flow. We may even venture to say that he recognized Jesus as the Messiah and the great priest who is acquainted with all our sorrows, who alone can cleanse thoroughly. Although he was alone in his reaction, his praise, he praised God with a loud voice. We sing this song, Though none go with me, still I will follow. But I have made my mind no turning back. This man said, though none comes with me, I am going to do what is the right thing to do. I'm going to praise God in a loud voice. And praise, indeed, he did. He was jubilant in praising and thanking God, given that he was physically, socially, and spiritually restored. 
Spurgeon once said regarding this grateful man, this grateful man's response. I caught Spurgeon here. External religious exercises are easy enough and common enough. But the internal matter, the drawing out of the heart in thankful love, how scarce a thing it is. Nine obey ritual where only one praises the Lord. I love that quote. The second response of the grateful ex-leper Worth noting is that, and we find that in 16a, he threw himself at Jesus' feet. He returned boldly, boldly confident in his new status as a clean man, no longer unclean. We know this because he no longer complied with the distance law of a leper. Just a while ago, in his leprosy state, he and his buddies called out for mercy with a loud voice from a distance. But when he returned, as a recipient of divine mercy, he came praising, falling at Jesus' feet and thanking him. He connected with the power and authority of Christ. And his actions demonstrated his understanding of the depth of what God has done. In his life, through his son, Jesus Christ. He recognized that Jesus is the agent of transformation and not just a mere compliance with some religious rights or laws can make you right. He sees Jesus as the great benefactor. The third striking thing about the grateful ex-leper is found in 16b. And this is the moment we all have been waiting for. Luke says, he was a Samaritan. He was a Samaritan. Intriguingly, Luke holds off on on this crucial detail about the man's identity as if to surprise his readers at the end. You know, I'm not a reader of the fiction genre, my wife is. But there was no escaping regarding the mysteries and, and thriller novels by Hadley Chase, the series of Hadley Chase. I like watching crime TV shows like Dateline. I'm not recommending them to you, please. I'm, not just, I'm just mentioning them. <laughs> like Dateline, Cold Case, and FBI Files. In these genres, the authors or the producers take you through a lot of suspense as they unravel a plot or a crime scene. They make you suspect a particular character is the villain or perpetrator of a crime by posturing pieces of evidence that align with the offense. But in the end, it always turns out to be a surprise as to who committed the crime. I believe Luke used a similar literary style in this narrative. He allows his readers to experience this fantastic, penultimate miracle of Christ before he arrives in Jerusalem to suffer and die upon the cross. He intentionally placed the man's identity in the story where it would have the most effect on his readers. Most early Jewish readers would have quickly concluded that this reputable man was a Jew. But alas, Luke says he was a Samaritan, not a Jew, a foreigner in the eyes of the Jews. Someone who in normal circumstances was despised by the Jews as idolatrous and half-breed. And that is a twist in the story. It's a twist there. Here are some takeaways we can glean from this segment. First, Luke probably wanted to remind his readers that God's grace is for everybody, regardless of race, creed, color, and status. 
It's for everybody. Everybody. Your race, your creed, your status does not matter. God's grace is for you, my friend. Second, he also wanted to point out that praising God or being thankful, following an answered prayer is the appropriate Christian response we all, we all should emulate. Thirdly, thanksgiving. And this is, I really want you to get this. Thanksgiving is a healthy spiritual discipline for every child of God. In his famous verse on dealing with anxiety, Paul stoutly admonishes Christians not to be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplications, with thanksgiving, make your request made known to God. Philippians 4 verse 6. But given those takeaways, I am hard-pressed to ask why then we struggle to give God gratitude, the gratitude he deserves for everything. Number one, we all are ungrateful by nature. We all, no exception, we all are ungrateful by nature. In other words, gratitude is not anyone's second nature. That is why we ought to train ourselves in it. Don't we train our children early in their lives to say thank you when they receive something? On the contrary, do we teach them how to demand their wants? No. When a child is hungry, they cry or they ask for food. Similarly, when we are in need, we pray or ask God for it. But like children, when we do not purposefully cultivate the habit of thanksgiving, we will not easily express our gratitude to God. We would not. So it's something that we have to cultivate. And secondly, why is it that we don't do it? We take many things for granted or assume we have absolute, absolute rights to health, happiness, and every possible comfort until we lose them, until we don't have it. I have personally learned over the years not to take anything for granted. But that habit of my heart became more evident in my recent health struggles. Every day I wake up without the bone-crushing pains I recently experienced and my body functioning at any capacity. I thank God for one more day of his mercies. If you know me, you would have noticed that regardless of my state, and this is not trying to boast about anything here. I always respond with praise God whenever people ask me how I am doing. Amen, Amen brother. But do not mistake that for everything to be okay with me. However, a grateful Christian does not wait until everything is okay to give thanks. Paul encourages us in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Even if you see nothing, to, nothing else to thank God for, thank him every morning for waking you up. Yes, it is he who wakes you up, not your alarm. Your alarm only reminds you that it is time to wake up. And some of you have a love-hate relationship with your alarms when it comes to waking up. No time for confession how many alarms you've broken. <laughs> Spurgeon's once said again that it is imperative for every Christian to thank God daily for waking them up and to thank him at the end of the day for his mercies. If you just do those things, those two things, and thirdly on this, why, why is it that we don't, we struggle to give thanks? It's because of our failure to stop and think 
about or remember God's goodness in our lives. We often tend to focus more on what we want than what we have already received. The old hymn, Count Your Many Blessings, succinctly puts it this way. Are you overburdened with a load of care? Are you discouraged thinking all is lost? Count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Maybe this is all some of you need this morning to relieve your anxiety, your discouragement, your depression or worries, and envy of what others have. Friends, I challenge you to surprise yourself this morning or in the coming days with the goodness of the Lord in your life by counting your blessings. Name them one by one. You will see reasons to praise or thank the Lord because I know with all my heart that the Lord has blessed you despite the challenges you might be going through. Quickly here, I conclude the last uh, movement here. We'll just be brief on this. Jesus responds with a commendation, 17 to 19. Jesus responds to the ungrateful Samaritan's action with three questions and one commendation. Question number one, were all ten not cleansed? This rhetorical question was intended to blow out or underscore the man's action and evoke a need for Luke's readers to reflect on the matter. Has God not been good to you? Question number two, where are the other nine? This question was equally intended to highlight the ingratitude of the other nine lepers. Why didn't they come back and praise God, the giver of every good and perfect gift? Why didn't they recognize Jesus' role in healing them? This was an indicting question or a stinging observation that the other nine missed the moment. Do I need to say that this question still holds true for us today? God is asking you and me this morning, what about the answer I provided to your prayers? Do you remember to thank me? Why do you just live with a gimme, 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 gimme mentality instead of a grateful heart? Question number three, Jesus asked, was none found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? You see that in 17c. This third rhetorical question was a significant endorsement of the actions of the grateful Samaritan. It is not only Luke who identifies the man's ethnicity, but Jesus himself also commends his action by calling him a foreigner. Perhaps to shame the other nine Jewish ex-lepers who would generally refer to themselves as the children of Abraham. But Jesus commends the action of this foreigner for acting in a manner congruent to an authentic child of Abraham. Here's his commendation. Jesus responds to the man's faith. To this man's faith, he says, to him, arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. There is no indication in the narrative that the other nine lepers received any less physical cleansing than the Samaritan. However, while their bodies may have been cleansed, only the Samaritan received healing for his soul. Given that Jesus directly dealt with him, it is safe to say that he received cleansing for his sins through faith. In other words, the grace of salvation appeared to him. This outsider's story proves that God's grace works in surprising ways to bring salvation to the unlikely.
here are the implications. First, since God has forgiven our sins through faith in Christ, we should always respond with gratitude toward him. Also, because God is the giver of everything we have, every mouthful of food, every breath we inhale, every peaceful moment we enjoy, and the reason why we bounce back after a crisis, it is imperative not only to acknowledge him as the benefactor, but praise him for his generosity. The rhythm of faith and gratitude are evidence of a genuine Christianity. Are you here this morning and you are not saved? I've got something for you. Like the lepers, every believer carries the weight of sin, of their sin, and they are an outcast in the kingdom of God. But Christ's redeeming grace is available for whoever turns to him for mercy. God accepts back into the fold. Those who call, who may have gone astray, or who feel estranged from him when they repent and turn back to him, he accepts. Friends, this is the point I have been arguing. That gratitude to God is not just a feeling, but tangible evidence of our understanding of Christ's transformative and life-changing work in our lives. Let us pray. It is only but befitting, O oh Lord, to thank you right now for all that you have done for us. But as we do that, we also repent for failing all this while to be grateful for the many things you've done for us. As we leave here today, God, Please, show us in areas of our lives or the, your manifold blessings that we will be thankful like this foreigner, like this Samaritan leper. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.